okay, so here I am, <laughs> let's start here. So here I am at lecture four, part two, um, with day one of Michael Hare, right? So um, I'm gonna talk about electronic media. This was the first war where film could be shot on one day and conceivably be shown on American networks within 36 hours. Now in World War II, uh, this just wasn't possible, partly because there were no TV networks, <laughs> which makes it very hard indeed. But as, as well, because the process of, of getting film, of shooting film on say a small handheld camera and then getting it back, let's say you're in Italy, and getting the film back to America, it would have to be flown back to America. It would have to be developed. It would have to be looked at by the censors. And then it would have to be put into a newsreel format so that it could go into a, news, to a theater, which is where it would be shown. It, there's just too many moving parts. It's just not gonna be possible to get, um, that's why photography is still king uh, so much at this point in say World War II. And photography is still fast. But the whole thing is speeding up and we're, we're getting towards that moment of being able to, you know, shoot and see it, um, which is what we can do now. Television coverage produced what Michael Arlen, uh, A-R-L-E-N, famously dubbed the Living Room War, um, because basically it came out of movie theaters and these newsreels and into people's living rooms. So that is, they would turn on the television set in, more, in the evening with supper and they would get the war. And when I talk about television sets, I'm talking about something that looked pretty much like this. And um, my God, this, uh, this kind of thing makes me, ugh, you know, I just, oh God. The televisions actually did look like this um, if you were, if you were well-to-do. Um, they, they were made to look like pieces of furniture. So it had stereo speakers, which you can see, I'm, it's probably down here. <laughs> And uh, as you can see these, you know, two orange stereo speakers and the control, um, which is also on that side, um, would have been the channel changer. There were very few remotes at this point. There were a few remotes, um, but you had to get up to change the channel. And let's say you had a good television aerial, which is mostly how people got, well, there was no such thing as cable. Uh, so the way that you, got a different station was you changed the channel. And um, so you literally turned a dial, you turned an analog dial, which moved a relay and you switched over to a different signal. Um, and you might get, depending on if you had really good coverage and you were in a, a well-served area, you might get four, five, six channels maybe. Um, if you had a really good mast, uh, television mast. And then here's this uh, the color TV for family on a budget. And you can tell they're on a budget because <laughs> the television's on, on rollers. So they would roll it out of the way, roll it back in the way. And so the idea about these televisions is that they're, they're seen as, as uh, sort of interruptions in the, the middle-class family decor, which is why they tried to make them look. And they often made them with doors that would be closed or slide panels that would slide shut and so on because they, they were considered to be unsightly. So you'll, <coughs> you'll see, <coughs> Excuse me. You'll see in the uh, in the small <coughs> portable television set um, the two little buttons that look like buttons at the top on the top of the of the machine. Those are aerials. So you actually would pull them up and then move them around to try to get a better picture, uh, which rarely worked. So um, remember that Westinghouse here owns. CBS, right? And that Westinghouse, I was just uh, talking about what, <laughs> what Westinghouse owns. By the time we get to 1995, Westinghouse will have purchased CB CBS, pardon me. Uh, and General Electric would also own its own uh, network. So they also both are major military suppliers. I mean, they, they are, any company which is involved in making electronic parts 
transistors, resistors, uh, miniaturizing things, working on uh, computers, miniaturizing computers, and so on. Uh, they are going to be involved in making material that is stuff for war. So, whoops, so, okay, I just thought I'd uh, save us a little bit of space here. But, so, this is in many ways a, a side, a tangent. The children of World War II, um, so these are the people who are going to go to, the, the, the young men who are going to go to Vietnam because they're 18, let's say, in the mid-60s, um, yeah, give or take. Um, these people who we call the boomers because they were part of the baby boom, which occurred when the veterans came home from World War II. So a bunch of young men, mostly, um, returned home and there was a mass uh, baby producing event. <laughs> and uh, that mass baby producing event produced a boom, a population boom, which has moved through uh, that generation has moved through the system. So basically it is that these are the children who were born probably just during when people were home on leave or after the war. So typically somewhere between 1940 and 1950, um, but usually between 1940, 45 and 50. And uh, this is the this is the boom that we're talking about. Then there is a, what is often called the echo. The boom actually carries on uh, through the 50s. And then there's an echo at the sort of end of it, um, which is the people born in the late 50s and the early 60s, where there's a second boom, which is not as, as big. So um, these, this, these boomers um, were interested in technology. They were interested in gadgets, hi-fi, electronics, that is high fidelity um, instead of Wi-Fi. And in their case, the technology was analog film. So it was uh, cameras um, and video, which hadn't, didn't exist yet. There was no such thing as video that you could record over. <laughs> it's like, no, I, just, I, I think that there was early, early video that was magnetic that could be re-recorded I, I, in the same way that you could use tape uh, because there was reel-to-reel -reel tape, which was magnetic, which you could record over. Um, but otherwise, basically, you were shooting film that had to be then developed and processed, and it was one time, that was it, and it was a very expensive process. Black and white was less expensive, it was a silver nitrate um, system as opposed to um, color, which was very expensive indeed. And uh, for those, you were producing this kind of, this kind of film, which was, uh, was in, in actual little cameras, or was made on Super 8, Camera, so not even 16 millimeter, but uh, eight millimeter film, called so-called Super 8 because of the, the way the film was actually produced. And this was all gonna sort of, the end was it was going towards television and towards home movies, which were a huge deal. So Michael Hare sees that the soldiers understand the power of the new media because they loved it in the same way that the generation, say, born in the, 60s was going to fall in love with early digital uh, technology and the same way that people born in the 80s would be digital, essentially the arguably the first digital natives in the sense that they would grow up and come of age in an, in an era of uh, digital technologies where computers are sort of, you have to have a computer to function. I understand that the digital native means you are born in an age where you only ever knew the digital world. Okay. And so, but Hare is onto this, right? He sees this, this young generation, these genera this generation of kids who were born in the 40s, uh, late 40s and, and the early 50s. Um, he says the grunts, and this is the sort of comfortable term for the soldier in Vietnam, which is grunt. Why? Um, well, um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, the agreement is generally that in, in World War I, each army had a, a sort of slang, affectionate term for its soldiers. Um, the American was a doughboy. Um, in the, the French uh, had the poilu, um, which is sort of, it's no, there's no easy translation for it, but sort of like the, uh, 
what the, the British called the PBI, the poor bloody infantry, because they were just in the mud all the time, basically. And then they got killed in the mud and they drowned in the mud and so on. By World War II, the American soldier was known as a dog face. And it's probably because basically they were always unshaven because they, they were moving, the army was moving fast. I mean, the, the armies moved fast as opposed to World War I where they had time, they had time. Oh, they were, all they had was time to sit in the trenches um, and then get shot at, you know, terribly for a couple of, day, a couple of days and they were on a, an attack and then sit around again. So they had time to, they were supposed to stay shaven and so on. But the argument about the fast moving American military particularly and the British military for that matter, was that they didn't have time to shave. Um, so they sort of looked like they were bedraggled, so the dog face. By the time we get to Vietnam, they're called grunts. And that's partly because they were carrying so much stuff. And so they literally grunt, I mean, the, the, the process of being an infantry person now was an infantry man at the time, because there were no infantry women, um, was one of brutal physical labor. And in this, in this very, these tropical conditions of being, you know, having it be 120 degrees and uh, brutally sunny or uh, having it be in a monsoon, you know, where the, it was virtually impossible to move around, um, although they were expected still to move around. They were carrying heavy packs, um, 50 pounds, and they weren't, these, the packs that they, they had, you know, the straps weren't padded. These were, this was canvas, what was called canvas webbing. So, physically, there was a lot of physicality to this, to this terrible job. So they were called grunts. The grunts were hip enough to the media to take photographers more seriously than reporters. And I'd met officers who refused to believe that I was really a correspondent because I never carried cameras. During a recent operation, this had gotten me bumped from command chopper because the colonel, for reasons of his own, was partial to photographers on page 200. So here is Hare, you know, really reflecting carefully on what's going on in terms of the media. You know? The grunts understood the photographer is where it's at because the photographer is going to get his picture, the grunt's picture, in a paper. Might be the Stars and Stripes, might be the paper at home, uh, you know, local interest. And this, people didn't believe, you know, they don't believe you. You're not a correspondent unless you have a camera. If you don't take a, if you don't take a picture, it didn't happen, right? As they used to say, pics, pictures or it didn't happen. During a recent operation, okay, so he gets bumped from the command chopper. Now, if you go out on a mission, which is flown by helicopter, there would be one or two choppers, which would be, uh, as a helicopter, which would be um, run by the officers or for the officers. So you would have probably a captain. At the, I wouldn't expect more than a captain. Maybe a major, maybe, I, it's rare. Um, to have a major in the field like that. It's a dangerous place to be. Uh, being in a fire base is like that's in the field enough. But a captain might very well go out on a helicopter. So the captain goes out with his aides, which probably includes a junior lieutenant, um, and they're going to watch whatever the battle is from 5,000 feet, which is low. Uh, I mean, that's close to the ground. And, but it's also with, with outside of rifle range, so they can't be sniped, basically, uh, successfully. And um, they're going to give commands uh, to the people on the ground. So the journalists would be in those helicopters, so they're actually going out into, com they're going out into combat with the soldiers. Now, this was very much the pattern of World War II, that journalists were landed, uh, on these beaches, not in the first wave, but they did land uh, with the men and they reported on the conditions and they got killed in fantastic numbers. Um, so it was part of the understanding that um, media uh, coverage of the war was in World War II part of winning it. And the expectation for these media, these, these journalists and correspondents uh, who are almost all men, again, not entirely, but mostly, um, was that they would tell the story that America wanted told because they were Americans, weren't they? So. Anyway, so Hare gets bumped out of the command chopper because he doesn't have a camera. So the, or the what is it, the captain, right? No, the colonel. Wow, it's a colonel. Okay, that's, that's very rare. It's like, you know, get this, get this guy out of here. He's not going to make me famous. He's not going to make me look good. 
So the military is interested in getting the story out and also being stars. And this is the beginning of this craze, which we are now really reaping the, you know, the, the bloody oats of, um, of people being, you know, everybody has to be a star to be alive. It's like, how about not, you know, how about, <laughs> how about not, you know, putting your food on Instagram, you know, like, uh, what a concept, you know. Um, but because the press had been complicit in recording essentially what happened in World War II, and they told the story that Americans want to told. I mean, they didn't cover massacres, you know, mass American men massacring people. That just didn't happen. It might have happened, but it didn't get covered, that's for sure. Or if it got covered, it got buried. You know, this report, the stories did not get reported. So um, the Allies were not going to be made to look bad by the media. That was the agreement. But by the time we get into the middle of the war, and so this is why uh, in Vietnam, the commander, the Supreme Commander, Supreme Allied Commander, which is who was General William Westmoreland, who I talked about, gave unrestricted access to the battlefield to these reporters so they could get on these choppers and come and go. So when Hare talks about taking choppers like buses, they, they were like, you know, who are you? It's like, they would be wearing fatigues because they looked like they, want, they needed to look like soldiers and they couldn't wear civilian clothes. So they were fatigues. So they looked like soldiers, sort of. They would have a helmet and a flak jacket, probably. Um, and uh, and they'd say, you know, who are you? It's like, oh, no, we're, uh, you know, with the New York Times. It's like, okay, get on, the, you know, get on the chopper, go. You know, it's like, yeah, that's fine. You know, the press is, yeah, press is welcome here. So Westmoreland does, does this because he has the belief that the rest of America has shares that journalists would not report on bad things that Americans did. They were not looking for those kinds of stories. And this changed when Seymour Hersh covers the Amelia Massacre in 1968. And I'll talk about that in a, in a couple of weeks. And when Morley Safer, and I gotta, gotta say, you know, go Morley, go Morley Safer, who was a Canadian, showed footage of a Zippo raid. And this was the first time that that made it onto the television. So a soldier lighting a Zippo lighter, holding the Zippo lighter out to the thatch of uh, a Vietnamese home and burning it down. That was standard. Remember I talked about this as policy, Zippo raids, right? Burn them and move them. But it hadn't been shown to American civilians before this. So Morley Safer who was a Canadian stringer for CBS, shot this, <laughs> shot this footage with one of his camera people and they sent the film home and CBS put it on. They were like, wow, we've got to show this. Now, of course, this was just standard practice in Vietnam. The guys were like, yeah, we do that every day. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you do this every day? And Americans look at this, they're like, we don't burn people's homes. Well, that's terrible. What are we doing? This is 1968. And Johnson flew into a rage when this happened, when it was, it was like, he called CBS and he said, stop the film. So this whole thing about, you know, Trump uh, and trying to, you know, uh, prevent Twitter from doing this and, and getting in, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's face, so to speak, about Facebook, is like, that's not new. Uh, presidents have often been involved in uh, influencing the media or trying to stop stories or trying to start stories or trying to get things going. It's not as though this is all, oh, it's the first time we've ever seen this. You know, America has been pure and innocent up until now. It's like, no, no, good Lord. <laughs> so anyway, Johnson says, you know, oh, who is that guy who got that footage? Uh, he must have been a communist. And uh, so eventually they, they began, look, the FBI began looking into Morley Safer and they were like, oh, he's not a communist, he's a Canadian. <laughs> Johnson said, I knew that guy wasn't an American. So, okay. So at this point, I'm gonna show you uh, what, the, um, what the, what it looked like to go to a news conference in the late 60s. Um, so here's John Pilger with the so-called uh, dreaded five o'clock follies, uh, which will make you a true believer. 